The final thing that I want to talk about in this lesson on built-in JavaScript objects are a couple of quick hitter topics that we're going to get through rather quickly. And the first one is going to be the math object. So let's go ahead and look. If we go to the documentation on MDN, go to JavaScript, go to built-in objects, and go down to the math object, you're going to see that there's a lot of built-in math functions. And as a developer, you might be saying, well, hey, I'm not writing a bunch of finance applications. I probably don't need this. Well, I'll show you in just a few seconds why it might be useful for you. All right, so if we go down here, this is a little bit different than we're used to seeing. So if we come into the console and talk about like dates or something, we know that we can make a date by saying new date. All right, so that's the syntax that we're used to. It's called the constructor syntax because we are constructing a, uh, I guess, copy of this uh, date template or the object. I mean, these are all terms that I'm kind of using in quotations because they're not uh, perfectly true, but you kind of get the point. All right, so this is the way of constructing an object. Now, with the math library, you'll see that all of the methods, we're just taking the actual object, we're, so we're saying math, and then we're just executing the method against it. So instead of saying, let's say, my date equals new date, and then we say my date dot get uh, date or something like that, we are uh, first constructing the object and then using a method on it. And this is how we've done it with all of these. So you might say, well, why don't we say uh, math equals new math, and you press enter and it's gonna say math is not a constructor. Well, this gets us into uh, the concept of object-oriented programming. Um, the math library actually has, rather than instance methods, so uh, with the previous ones, with the date object and the string and the array, we have to first construct the actual object and then we uh, call methods on top of that object which are called instance because we have an instance of that object and we call methods on top of it. Now with the math library, we're just using static methods. So we just call it directly from the object and it's pretty simple. So let's just go through a couple of quick ones that you might um, you know, find useful. So uh, let's see what my list shows right here. So let's clear the screen. And here are some of the common ones. So we have math.py, that's gonna give you the value of pi. Um, we have math.e, so this is, I think, Euler's constant or something like that. That might be something that you use. Um, and then we start getting into the methods. So we have the absolute method, and we can actually um, pass in a negative number and get a positive or absolute value of that. We also have the uh, math.ceiling method, which is going to round up to the nearest integer. So let's say that we pass in math.pi, we're gonna round 3.14 up to the nearest integer of four. Likewise, we have the floor method. So we take math.py again, and it rounds it down to three. And then finally, we have the math.round method. And again, if we put in math.py, it's gonna round it to three because 3.14 is closer to three than it is to four. All right, so those are some quick uh, methods that you can use. You can also use the min and the max uh, method. So if we had min, you can pass in a couple numbers and this is gonna give you the smallest number. And then of course, max will do the opposite. So same numbers, but we get the highest number. All right, and then the final one is math.random. So this is gonna give you a random number, a random decimal between zero and one. Now this has implications that you probably don't understand, but we've actually used this to get a random index of an array for previous videos. And I'll show you exactly how we can do that. All right, so let's decompose this into steps. So first let's get a random number and set that equal to math.random. All right, so this is going to equal something between zero and one. Let's just see what it equals right now. All right, so it equals 0 0.97. All right, so we know that if we multiply um, something between zero and one by another number, it's going to give us a whole number between zero and whatever number we're multiplying it by. So if we multiply random number 
times five, we're going to get a number between zero and five. So we can use that to say that we want a larger number, we'll just call it that, and we'll say that will be equal to random number um, times a, you know, we'll say 100. So now we get zero to 100. And then finally, this is gonna be a decimal when we look at it. But if we wanted to bring this down to a whole number, we'd just say math.floor and then pass in the larger number and now we have 97. All right, so we can combine this with our knowledge of uh, the length of an array to get um, a range of random numbers that are within the bounds of an array. So let's just define an array real quick and we'll just say some values, blah, blah. All right, so we got four values in there. Um, the length of this array is four. So here's how we get a random index of our array. We'll say random index and we'll be setting that equal to. All right, so we will say math.floor because we know we need a whole number. Now we wanna pass in math.random, so a number between zero and one, and then we wanna multiply that by the array.length so that we can get from zero to the length of the array, which is always gonna give us a valid index. All right, so we will set that equal, press enter, and now we can just take our array and pass in our random index, and it's gonna give us a random value of that array. Now this may not seem uh, all that useful um, in actual code, but it's gonna be really useful when you're actually testing your code. So if you're unit testing your code, which we haven't talked about, um, it's often useful to just grab a random value from some array to test your code. Again.